Good morning, everyone. Welcome to First Baptist Church. We're glad that you're here this morning. Uh, pray that you've come to worship God and to um, remember His love for us in that He sent His Son to die for us in accordance with the Scriptures, to be buried and to rise again on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And we rejoice in that this morning. Um, I'd like to welcome all the visitors this morning, including those that <coughs> haven't been here for a few months. Uh, not to mention any names, but good to have you back, Joey. <laughs> Live in one piece. Um, and appreciate all you've done uh, your time away. So, um, and it's good to have everyone else here, too. Uh, don't forget to uh, fill out the red bulletin. Um, the red bulletin, <laughs> that's close. The red booklet, the attendance booklet, and then uh, if you are visiting uh, on your bulletin, <laughs> get my thoughts together here, there's a little addition here, flip, that, that we appreciate if you uh, fill that out and tear it off and put it in, into the offering plate as it comes by. Whew, boy, I'm not sure if my time's ready for this morning yet or not. <laughs> so, uh, Hope you've had a chance to read the announcements, and are there any others? I think Jeff had an announcement he'd like to make. Good morning, everyone. Just want to remind people that we have a sign-up sheet for uh, Church League Softball that's uh, going to be starting you know, probably in June sometime. Um, out by the farthest store, um, we're meeting in a, the coaches are meeting in the next uh week or so to get that going. So it's coming along and we'd like you to sign up sooner rather than later so we can get an idea of how many we're having and how many teams we have. But if you're going into the ninth grade or older, uh, you're welcome to sign up. Thank you. I think I fit the end older part. <laughs> <coughs> okay. Um, now let's join uh, together and welcome those around you with the right hand of fellowship. Yeah. 
come before you now, Lord, with so much to be grateful for, so much that we can sing praises to your name for. Lord, we thank you for the moisture that we've had recently, and, and Lord, we thank you most of all for your son Jesus, who brought life into this world. And we just pray that you just bless now this offering, that we might give it joyfully to bring glory and honor to your name. Please stand as you are able for praise and worship.
Good morning. Well, we are, glad, are, we are glad to be back in Clay Center. As many of you know, we were gone this past week to go and celebrate and honor my sister's memory. And I appreciate the many, many, many cards and thoughts and um, your graciousness in providing us with that opportunity. We got back yesterday afternoon and then had a dance recital and then got up this morning and uh, of course some of you don't know that we left Danielle and Lucas back in Michigan. I said, that's it. Oh, she may watch this, so maybe I shouldn't say that. <laughs> Hopefully she'll watch this, but she has not had an opportunity to spend any long-term time with her mother and father and she's an only child in, in well over a, a decade. And so, as we were thinking about heading back, I said, well, you know, you could stay for a little bit. So, so if you wonder over the next little bit where Danielle is, and if you start hearing in the community that Pastor Matthew left his wife, you'll understand the whole story. <laughs> but we are glad to be back, um, get back into the swing of things. Um, I appreciate very much uh, Katie and Jackie singing this morning. And Travis and Nikki playing, and Rosalie playing, and the choir singing. Um, but we're glad to be back here. This current, our, our passage this morning, I know you don't know. Is it up there yet? Oh, it is, to give you a clue. Oh, sorry. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 2 this morning. Um, this month, we have um, tried to highlight some of the benefits of Stephen ministry as we, you know, had our sermon time. And, and um, we have tried to recognize our Stephen ministry team. And I do want to just take a moment uh, to thank Deanna Barlene. I was planning to have a nice gift for you, but I was preoccupied this week. So I'll take care of that later. But would you stand for just a moment? Sit back down. Just a moment. No, just get up. Can you stand, stand up, please? Will you help show our appreciation to Deanna for all the service that she offers? I want to make her come all the way up here. Um, but we appreciate all that she does do. The, the Director of Stephen Ministry, it's a title that if, if you went to probably 95% uh, of other churches in the country and you said, well, we have a Director of Stephen Ministry, they say, what's that? And some of you sitting here in the pews, when we say we have a director of Stephen Ministry, I know you say, well, what's that? Well, just to give you a little, little glimpse into what Deanna does, um, I understand that when the job was originally created, that her job description was anything that nobody, or that anything that nobody, that nobody else will do or wants to do, she had to do. I didn't say that quite right, I know, but... And it hasn't really changed much since I've got here in that regard, but she works with our Stephen Ministry team. She works with our care groups. Uh, she's also working in organizing and helping to develop um, ministries for our ladies, for our families, for working with our men's coordinator. And uh, she also, of course, works with our lighthouse referrals. And so she is a busy lady. And so I appreciate very much all that she does do um, one of the benefits of the Stephen Ministry program is to make it a little bit easier for the pastor, and Deanna definitely does that. She's a great blessing to me and to our congregation, so we praise the Lord for that. And, and um, we will be looking forward to moving forward with her and continuing to develop that role. And so I just want to take a moment this morning to recognize her um, as we have celebrated this program during this current month because there has been many benefits and blessings to our congregation. This month we have explored several different things. We've looked at the idea of comfort and how God is the source of comfort, how we have experienced that as believers and we need to tell other people. You remember that title was called, or that sermon was called, You Can Lead a Horse to Water. Remember? Um, then we also talked about love and how we know love and we owe love and so we should show love. All right. And then we were challenged um, and challenged ourselves that the best things that we can offer 
our Christ, and ourselves. This morning, we will one last time, as we look at Paul's writings in Philippians chapter 2, verse 19 to 30, we're going to look at this idea of the church caring for one another. And the church caring. And this, this sermon is for all of us this morning. You know, sometimes, you know, when people go out and I don't want to pick on Jeff, but Jeff, Jeff Yero will often say, oh, so I know somebody who should have heard that sermon, you know, and sometimes we do that. We leave and say, oh, that sermon would be really good for somebody else, but today I want this to be a sermon for all of us, all right? You know, and as, as a pastor, as you write very often when you're writing a sermon or, or you're preparing a sermon, you write things that you yourself need to hear. So if you're ever sitting in the pew someday thinking, man, he's stepping on somebody's toes, very often, I'm stepping on my own toes, you know. I just have the notes so I can get them out from under my other foot before it falls. So when we're talking about caring about others, it's a message for all of us. It's a message for all of us. And in just a moment, we're going to read that passage in Philippians chapter 2. So hopefully you're finding, uh, finding it. Because um, I want to begin by sharing a, a little story about this idea um, the, the, this picture here that we're going to be talking about, it comes from a, a Disney movie, and it's one of Lucas's favorite movies, and we never watched it until probably about four or five months ago, and ever since we watched it, we've watched it and 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 watched it. And it's that movie Cars, do you ever see that? Um, and, the, and the character in that movie is Lightning McQueen. Now Lucas, for some reason, calls him uh, Bessie. Now, in the movie, there is a character, or it's a piece of equipment, called Bessie, and he used to call him McQueen, but McQueen has now transi transitioned into Bessie, and he has his Bessie cup and his Bessie plate, and they even have little pouches of Bessie fruit that you can buy, and so he loves Bessie. He loves Bessie. And in that movie, Cars, um, it begins, and, and you learn that this Lightning McQueen character really wants to win. His goal is to win. He wants to win this race so he can win this trophy. And so at the very beginning of the movie, and spoiler alert, if, you're never, if you've never seen the movie and you want to see it, cover your ears for a couple seconds. But at the beginning of the movie, he does something silly and causes there to be a three-way tie. And then throughout the movie, he is educated because he gets stuck in a community that's, you know, if Clay Center is here, it's about down here somewhere, right? And through his misadventures with the, this, these, this community, he learns the value of friendship. He learns that lesson. And so at the very end of the movie, when he's just about to win the race, he looks back on one of the television screens and sees that one of his competitors has um, spun out and has been in a crash, and it was a mentor of his. And what does he do? Right before the end of the race, he slams on the brakes and goes back to get that other car. Now, because of that, somebody else wins the race, but... Lightning McQueen realizes that even though he lost the race, he still was the winner because he cared enough and he had these friends. And that really is the lesson for us because he and that other one, I think his name was the King, they crossed the finish line together. And by doing that, yes, he lost the race, but he gained so much more. You know, Solomon met in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, he wrote, Two are better than one. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion, but woe to him who's alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. We all get knocked down from time to time, don't we? We're not like those little toys that I used to have when I was little, they look like eggs, you know, the weebles. The weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. Now some of us look a little bit more like weebles than others, we all fall down or get knocked down at times in life. 
But how wonderful it is when we have friends who care enough to lift us back up and to help us continue on. Well, hopefully you've turned to Philippians chapter 2, verse 19. I've given you plenty of time to get there. Let's stand and listen to the Apostle Paul. Because the Apostle Paul really is a great example of tender, a tender and compassionate friend. Philippians chapter 2, verse 19 to 30, it says this. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need. Since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick, for indeed he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him the more eagerly, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem, because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the opportunity to be here this morning. We're thankful, we're thankful for uh, the many prayers that have been said in preparation for this time. We're thankful for the time of Sunday school and fellowship. We're thankful for the songs and the time of giving, for the reading of your word. And Father, we just pray that you would be with us now, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would encourage us, motivate us, perhaps step on our toes. But we give this time to you and pray that you would work as you see fit. We know that there are many here to, are, that are not here today that would like to be. We ask that you bless and encourage them. But we do pray also for those that are here that this would be a time of worship for us all. For you are worthy of it. Worthy of our glory, our honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as I say, Paul is a fascinating example for us of a friend. Um, in fact, uh, someone has noted that there are more than 100 people listed as Paul's friends in the New Testament. You know, now some of you I know are on Facebook. And you have probably way more than a hundred friends on Facebook, don't you? Well, one of the reasons Paul had so many friends was because he was a good friend himself. So this morning we're going to consider three very important lessons that we learn from Paul's writing to the church at Philippi. The first is that we need to cultivate an interest in other people. We need to cultivate an interest in other people. In verse 19, Paul says, I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. Now, Paul was a missionary, you know, and we know we have many missionaries that we support, and we try to be an encouragement to and we see many missionaries in the New Testament. And sometimes missionaries write letters of appeal. You know, 
Either they have a need for something, or there's um, uh, a need for finances, or there's a, a situation uh, that's going on in their particular area of, of the world. So it would be logical for Paul here to have written a letter. You know, he might have said something like, to Mr. and Mrs. Timothy Mayo, I'm in prison here at Rome, all right? And the conditions are really bad. I need help. So please take up a special offering and send it to me as quickly as possible. You know, he might have sent something like that. And you know, I just as a, as a note to, to warn you, sometimes people do send those notes and you always want to check them out. I remember when we were in Michigan, I got a, a letter and an email from a missionary we supported that said that she had gone out of the country. And of course, I thought, well, that lady never went out of the country, so I knew it was a, a hoax. But, you know, if you get a letter saying, you know, dear Jeff and Diana Mayo, this is Pastor Matthew, I'm stuck in Michigan, please send a $1,000. If it's Michigan, you might want to do it, but <laughs> if it says I'm in Brazil or something, don't send it. But Paul doesn't do any of that here, does he? Instead, he's concerned not with himself, but with them. He's concerned about them. So he wants to send some encouragement to them through Timothy. He wants to send him to find out how things are going. And he wants so much for the report to be good news. You know, it's kind of like a parent. Every time they get that email or that envelope that's from the school at, at report card time, we want so much for the news to be good. Well, that's the same for us, for a lot of people. You know, in our lives, we, you, we have different days, perhaps some of you on Saturdays, you use that day to check up on the family. Uh, married children will call their, their parents, or sisters and brothers will, will call each other. It was interesting this last week as I was visiting with my aunts and uncle and with my parents um, to hear about the many times that my father, uh, he had uh, six brothers and sisters, and he takes time every month to call them, and he has one sister, and she's always been very special to him. And my mother was sitting there saying, oh yeah, when he calls Aunt Nancy, they'll be on the phone for two and a half hours. You know, and, and I have an appreciation for my sister and my, my the one that passed, and I'm just sitting here going, I don't think I could come up. Now, I'm a pastor, and you know I can talk, but I don't think I could come up with two and a half hours worth of stuff to talk to my sister about. <coughs> But we do that. Either we, we Facebook them or we email them or, or somehow we, we try to keep in touch. And if it's not family, then it's friends, close friends, people that we know. We're interested. We want to hear their news. We want to celebrate their joy. And so that's what Paul was doing. The Apostle, in the same way, we see in verses 3 and 4, he writes, he says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. In other words, we're to be genuinely concerned about each other. Genuinely concerned. And again, I, 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 I appreciate and I share with you um, Danielle's appreciation, um, the great outpouring of support and encouragement that we've had and, um, in the morning of my sister. I, I shared with Deanna a little bit yesterday at, at the funeral home on, on Tuesday evening. You know, my brother was there and his friends came in, and my sister was there and her friends came in, and my parents were there and their friends came in, and I sat with Danielle, and I kept saying, all our friends are 900 miles away. <laughs> and not one of you bothered to come to Michigan. <laughs> no, no. I didn't expect that any of you would. But I was able to sit there and go, how nice it was to see that. To see those people come. To support them. They were genuinely concerned. And I know that you were genuinely concerned for us. 
But do we ever ask ourselves on Sunday mornings, what about church? Yeah, there's family. Yeah, there's friends. What about the church? Are these people sitting in the pews just members of a church, or are they our friends and family? Do we care about each other? What about it? A couple weeks ago we asked ourselves, why do we even come here? Do you remember that? Do we come here because we think we have a debt to God? Oh, I owe it to God to come to church? Oh, I owe it to mom and dad to come to church? Oh, maybe I'm, I'm carrying a heavy burden and if I go to church, maybe it'll be lifted? Oh, I like the music or I don't like the music? We talked about that. Is it the fellowship? Is it the preaching? Why are we coming? Why should we? Well, if we're genuinely interested in, in one another, then this church should really be a training ground where we learn how to help each other. Where we're given opportunities to serve one another. When we reach out. Even if it's to people that aren't like us. You know, if, if you're a teenager and there's a senior citizen here that needs help, hey, you know what, you can help them. And the reverse, if you're a senior citizen and there's a teenager here that needs help, you can help them. They may not like it. When we come to the church, we need to be on the lookout. You know, a lot of you I know are hunters. And you get up there and you have your deer stand. And you get up there and you watch and watch and watch and watch and watch. And you hunt and you look and you look and you wait and you wait and you wait. Or you're fishers and you go and you stand out there or sit out there in your boat. And you wait and wait and wait and wait for that fish to finally take a nibble. But we look and we look and we look. For that deer, for that fish. And then we walk into the church on a Sunday morning and the blinders come on. And we walk up to people and say, how are you? And what do we say? What do they say? Fine. And then they say, well, how are you? And we say, fine. Thanks for asking. But that's about the extent of it. We need to be on the lookout. Because around us, in our congregation, there are people that are struggling. There are mothers that both hands are full and they don't know what to do. There are husbands that are thinking about leaving their wives. <coughs> there are children that are frustrated. There are people that have lost loved ones that are mourning and hurting. We just have to look for them. We have to look for them. Or perhaps you're sitting near a visitor Sorry, visitors, if you're here. This is a bad day to come, I guess. They may be here for the first time. Well, what can we do? We can, of course, we have our time of greeting, but we can introduce ourselves. We can say hello. We can say, shocking, I'm glad you're here. But only say it if you mean it. We can take our prayer lists and learn about somebody who's going through a difficult time. And then we could send them a card, call them, or we could be really crazy and actually pray for them. All around us. Now I realize and I praise the Lord, I know many of you are already doing those very things. And we give thanks to the Lord. I praise God for it. But you know what? You know who should be doing it? There's 140 of us here today. You know how many of that 140 ought to be doing that? 63? 104? No. Every single one of us. You say, well, Pastor, that's just not who I am. I just don't do that kind of thing. 
I don't get emotional. I don't get involved. Well, aren't you glad Jesus didn't feel that way? Folks, we don't have a choice. We are called to do it. And yes, yeah, sometimes it's difficult, but we need to still do it. You know? Now, things happen when we're genuinely concerned about others. First of all, we begin to forget our own problems. You know, and we seldom realize that. We think that when I'm having trouble, I need to, to deal with my own problems first. I need to do something just for me. I know when, when we were talking about um, Danielle staying in Michigan, and she'll love that I'm talking about her, but she'll see it, so... Because my wife does not like me to talk about her. And if I ever talk to you and start talking about my wife, you just go. We've been married for all these years, and one thing, I, I just cannot stop talking about my wife because there's so many good things to talk about. But her mother said, well, you know, Danielle is under an awful lot of stress. It probably would be good to let her have a couple weeks of vacation up here with mom and dad. And I said, Danielle's under an awful lot of stress. Maybe we should send Danielle back to Kansas and let me stay with mom and my mother and father-in-law for a couple of weeks. <coughs> oh, well, at least I don't have to change dirty diapers. <laughs> <laughs> so don't bring your babies. You can say, hey, I want you to keep, keep in practice. But I should call Danielle and say, I expect him to be fully potty trained by the time you come back. <laughs> she may take me up on that. It may be a while, so maybe I won't say that. But... <laughs> oh. But sometimes we think it's all about us. I'm going to do something for me. I'm going to be extravagant. I'm going to be indulgent. But that's not the answer. The Bible doesn't teach us that. The Bible tells us that the quickest way to get rid of our own troubles is to become involved in helping someone else. The prophet Isaiah knew that long ago. Isaiah... Oh. Isaiah 58, that's Jeremiah, 58 verse 10. If you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness, and your darkness shall be as the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Those from among you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. Whew, that sounds good. And that's what we are. That's what we are. Secondly, when we're genuinely concerned about others, we find that when we're in trouble, others will be good friends to us as well. So the first thing that we learn from Paul's words here is that we need to cultivate a genuine interest in each other. Ooh, time is flying by this morning. I only had four pages of note and I'm done with one point. And I've been talking for 25 minutes. That's what happens when you send the pastor away for a week. All right, now the second lesson that we learn is that we need to offer sincere encouragement to others. In verse 20, Paul says, I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. Paul's still talking about Timothy, and Paul had discipled Timothy and watched him grow in his faith. You know, it's so exciting as a pastor or a Sunday school teacher to see people growing in their relationship with the Lord. And sometimes it happens very um, dramatically, and you can see very dramatic differences in people in a short time. Other times it happens kind of slowly. But it's always exciting to take a step back and look at somebody and see, wow, God really does work in people's lives. And Paul was encouraging and celebrating that because he watched him grow. And now Timothy was at a point um, that he was in his own ministry. And Paul looks at him and says, um, really, he says something, I don't know anybody like I know Timothy. All right. 
In fact, the, the New American Standard Version of the Bible translates the verse to say, I have no one else of kindred spirit. Some Bible commentaries, commentaries have even suggested that it, it, it has the idea almost of the same soul. The idea of having the same soul as that Paul person. Paul is saying, Timothy and I have the same soul. We're kindred spirits. We're like minded. Now I know we all have different levels of friendship with people. Even looking around this room, some people you're very close with, some people you kind of have casual acquaintances, maybe there's some people here you don't even know what their name is. But as we walk around our different days, you know, we, we don't have to think in our minds, do we? Well, this is somebody I know really well, and this is somebody I don't know very well. We just automatically know that. The different experiences that we've had together, together um, the different things that we have done, the different things we've seen God do. And we've already kind of talked a little bit about that idea of casual friendships. Those ideas, those are those people that you just say, yes, yeah, I'm fine, you're fine. And then there's those other people that if they come to you and they say, how are you? You just spill it all. You just lay it all out there. You know, you just dump it all out. You know, some people, you know, yep, 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 they come in and just, Whoa! You know. Maybe that's just me. Jacob and I, the other, no, I'm just kidding, Jacob. <laughs> but we do, we all have people like that. But that's not a casual relationship. That's somebody who we're close with. We enjoy spending time with, doing things together. It's a deeper, more meaningful relationship. And we share things that we normally don't share with others. But there are very few of those same soul kind of friendships. People that we're so close to, that we, we think alike, that we're motivated by the same thing. You know, and it's, it's scary to be around those kinds of people because they think so much like you. That they know what you're going to say even before is sad. You know, and I, and I love all of my children, but Katie and I almost have that kind of thing, and it gets her not in trouble, but she can't get away with anything because I know exactly what she's thinking. She and I are very similar. You know, and, you know, as the, the car trip home, you know, it just, it, we were talking about some different things and some of the things that she liked, you know, and some of the things she was like, well, that's not, that's not right. You know, just, oh, oh, oh. But when we'll have discussions, and you know what I mean by discussions, <laughs> she can't even say things because I already know them. That's what she's going to say. Is it because I have special mind powers? I'll try them on Kimberly Mayo again. <laughs> she's not thinking anything, I guess. Not. <laughs> and it's not that. It's just we are so much alike. You know, and, and Danielle and I, in many ways, we are alike, but we, in many other ways, we're very different. And she always says, well, we're yin and yang, and that's true. She, she balances me pretty well. You know. And if you're blessed to have a spouse that is very, very similar to you, um, I guess that could be both a blessing and a curse. But, but Timothy here is talking about this, or Paul is talking about this idea of the the same soul. You know those people you don't have to put on the act. You don't have to pretend. You can be who you are. Warts and everything. You can burp in front of them and they're not going to go, oh! You all know you burp. I've heard some of you burp. But, oh well. But Timothy writes that. And then in verse 21 he says, For all seek their own, not the things which are of Jesus Christ. And I think Paul here is presenting a contrast. He's saying, most everybody else looks out for their own interest. But Timothy, Timothy's not like everybody else. He's special and he's interested in you. He's interested in you. We need friends like that, and we need to be friends like that. Someone who will pick us up when we fall. They will brush us off. They will hold our hand 
and go with us as we go toward the finish line. Well, there's one more lesson here. We need to learn and we need to practice an unselfish release. Verse 25 begins the story of Epaphroditus. And Epaphroditus was a member of the church in Philippi. And the church was a, a strong supporter of the Apostle Paul. All right. So when they learned that Paul was in prison, um, they sent Epaphroditus to be with him, to be a source of encouragement and assistance to him. But Epaphroditus wasn't able to help very long because why? Because he became seriously ill. He became sick and in fact he almost died. Well the news of Epaphroditus' illness got back to Philippi and the people there were very concerned about him. All right. And so Epaphroditus became distressed about their anxiety for him. You know, and we all know people like that. They're worried because you're worried about them. You know, very often moms are like that. That's why they don't tell us things. They don't want us to worry. Well, it would have been easy for Paul to say, well, Timothy's leaving. And now um, you want to go too. What am I supposed to do here in prison all by myself? You know? Who's going to help me? But instead, Paul writes to that church in Philippi. Philippi and says, no, I'm sending Epaphroditus back to you. I'm sending him back to you, and I want you to welcome him. All right? And encourage him. Because he almost died for the cause of Christ. He almost died for the cause of Christ. A friendship that is really a friendship will release. It'll let us go. It won't be selfish or that smothering kind of love. You know, we all know what it feels like to be smothered. You know, somebody that's kind of sitting over your shoulder all the time. That's not what we ought to be doing as friends. You know, husband and wives can sometimes do that. Parents can sometimes do that too. But there comes a time in every home, when we need to let people go, we need to let them go. You know? I'd like to tell you that that's the end of the story, but it really isn't. You know, over in 2 Timothy chapter, or verse, yeah, chapter 4, Paul is in prison again, and the circumstances are very different this time. His friends aren't there. I don't know where they are. Maybe they're too far away to get to them. Maybe they're in prison, or maybe they're dead. Or maybe they just got tired of coming to prison to see Paul, because he was arrested a lot. But Paul writes these words in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. It says, At my first offense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Our best friend is Jesus, if we believe in him. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And when we fall, he will pick us up. He will dust us off. And he will hold our hands as we race toward that finish line. Kind of like that Lightning McQueen character did in the movie Cars. He went back. He didn't finish the race without him. This morning, as we celebrate <coughs> friendship, as we celebrate Stephen ministry, as we are challenged to be those kind of friends, let us always remember that we have a friend and his name is Jesus. And if he's not your Lord and Savior today, he can be. He can be. If he's not your friend today, let us introduce him to you. After all, that's what we're here for. Because he stands ready to meet you and to meet every need in your life. To forgive all of our sins. And to give us a promise of everlasting life. 
all he asks is that we come. Will you come today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this opportunity to come together to look at this passage of Scripture in Philippians, to read it and to contemplate it and to be challenged by it. And we pray, Lord, that as we think about Stephen ministry and the role that it has in our church, that we wouldn't just be satisfied allowing the Stephen ministry team to do the work, but know that we will answer the call. We will go where you want us to go. We will allow you to have control in our lives. And we will be the kind of friends that you want us to be. Those that genuinely care for one another. Those that have a deep relationship and those that are willing to let each other go when the time comes. That we will not hold grudges against one another. Father, we pray that any that are here today that don't yet know you as their God, that have not yet accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that this would be the day that they make that choice. Lord, perhaps there are some here that would um, feel the need to be baptized, or some would like to join the church, Lord. We pray that this would be the day that, that, that your Spirit works in their hearts as well. But Father, we just pray that as we have this time of invitation that your Holy Spirit would work in each of our lives. That when we leave this place this morning, that we would be changed and challenged and encouraged. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we have our song of invitation. church. There is a concert of several men from the community are going to be singing songs um, and it's a fundraising event for the American Cancer Society for the Relay for Life. So if you are available this afternoon and would like to um, attend that, you are invited to do so at the Wesleyan Church. And also I would like to share with you that, I, uh, this is short notice I know, but we're not going to have Sunday evening service tonight. I know we didn't have it last week. And just getting back and everything, I beg that you would allow me to have one more week without it this evening. Irene, I know, isn't here this morning. Do continue to pray for John. They're home from the hospital. Um, so we're going to cancel our Sunday evening service as well. Um, but let's be dismissed with prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the opportunity to come together um, this morning. We pray that you would go with us now as we go to our home or other destinations. We'll give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.